Stu Schmill is MIT's Dean of Admissions, a post he has held since 2008. His career at MIT began in 1982 when he enrolled as a freshman. Following his graduation in 1986 with a degree in mechanical engineering, he spent a year designing cars at General Motors before returning to MIT. During his long tenure at MIT, Stu has served the institute in a variety of positions, including director of crew, director of parent, student, and young alumni programs in the Alumni Association, and director of MIT's Educational Council. He joined the admissions office in 2002, was appointed interim director in 2007, and dean in 2008. Stu has been honored with the MIT Dean for Undergraduate Education Infinite Mile Award for Leadership. He was named Coach of the Year in the Eastern Association of Rowing Colleges, the most competitive rowing league in the country, and has won numerous medals as a coxswain in the head of the Charles Regatta. Beyond MIT, Stu has served as trustee, founder, or advisor to a variety of organizations, including the College Board, University of Cambridge International Examinations, Wayland Weston Rowing Association, To The Water, Inc., and the Mandela Town Hall Health Spot. He lives in Needham with his wife, Debbie, and two daughters, Sammy and Becca. Stu, thanks a lot for coming in today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So let's uh, just start at the beginning. Uh, tell me a bit about where you were born and, and where you grew up. Well, I grew up in New York City, in Queens, on the uh, far eastern, northeastern side in a place called Little Neck, and um, grew up playing stickball and uh, paddle ball, a lot of New York City kinds of things. My playground was a uh, cement schoolyard, so that's sort of where we used to play and hang out. Went to a big public school in Queens, and my graduating class uh, at Cardoza High School was about the same size as my freshman class here at MIT, so it wasn't such a big transition for me. What about your family? Uh, your parents, what, what did they do? What were they like? So my, uh, neither of my parents uh, had gone to college. They both grew up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan in the tenements there, and um, after they'd gotten married was when they were able to leave, move uh, out to the, the country of Queens. And, um, but they uh, um, you know, always appreciated education and gave me every opportunity uh, when I was growing up to pursue the things I wanted to do. So it sounds like a pretty big transition for you, you know, sort of deciding to go to MIT, thinking about, about college in general. How did that happen? Were you really interested in math and science and in school, or how did that decision process take place? Well, I certainly was interested in math and science, and I, I, I think I can even pinpoint the moment that really sparked my interest. In ninth grade, which where I grew up was still in junior high school, so my high school for me was 10th through 12th. So in ninth grade, during the winter break, one of our assignments was to go to the Museum of Natural History on the Upper West Side of Manhattan and uh, answer a bunch of questions um, about, uh, I remember we going through a few of the different halls, but particularly the Earth history. And I remember going through that and just being completely absorbed in it and thinking it was just absolutely fascinating. And from there forward, it really sparked an interest in learning about science and the way the world worked. And so I carried that into high school and um, started doing things like math team and took all the, the AP science classes that I could and all of that and just really loved it. It was great, yeah. As, as someone who's ended up spending their career in admissions, I, it seems like this would be a great question to ask you. How did you become aware of MIT uh, as an option when you were in high school and you were trying to sort of think about where you wanted to go? Yeah, so MIT, I guess I had heard of it, and my guidance counselor had mentioned it. Um, it wasn't something, it, it was far off in my consciousness. I mean, I didn't, I hadn't really traveled outside of, of Queens to visit colleges. I did participate for two summers when I was in high school. Back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, 1980s, the National Science Foundation used to sponsor these summer programs for students. And I did two of them. I did one in Wichita, Kansas, at Wichita State University, and another one down in Charleston, South Carolina. And um, those were uh, 
programs that were, you know, summer programs focused on science, science and math. I learned how to program computers at the one in, in South Carolina. And so, and MIT, people had been conscious of MIT, and so I'd heard of it. I'd never come up here to visit. And so basically I applied, when I was applying to colleges, I applied to three schools, uh, the local state university of New York at Stony Brook, which was on Long Island near my house, and uh, MIT was the second, and the third was a school that had actually uh, given me a merit scholarship before I had even applied, and it was one of these, uh, it, it's a school that offers these uh, high school awards for students, and, and if you get admitted to the school, you get a merit scholarship, so I, it was in my consciousness. So I applied to three schools, uh, fully planning that I was going to go to the state university, and, and would have been very happy with that, and that would have been great, but somehow I, was, I got into MIT, and, um, and even after I got in, I mean, first of all, I thought it was a mistake. I thought maybe somebody had misplaced, put my application in the wrong file. But once I had realized I had gotten in, I still wasn't sure I was going to go because it was going to be a lot more expensive. And now uh, we did receive a lot of financial aid, but, you know, still it was a bit of a stretch. And I remember, I actually remember my father sat me down and he said, you know, if you have a shot to go to a place like MIT, we'll make it work. And... You know, I'll, I'll always remember that and really appreciate it, and so I did, and that's what we did. I, I went to MIT, and um, the rest, I guess, is history here. I've been here for a very long time. So <clears throat> you, um, you mentioned that you hadn't visited MIT. Did you visit MIT then in between as you are making the decision or before you actually enrolled? Right. So the first time I actually set foot on campus was for orientation week. Um, I had not visited, and um, I remember that I remember my parents taking me uh, into the middle of Queens. I got on a Greyhound with a big duffel bag, and I took the bus up here, got into South Station. Somehow I found my way on the T to make it here, and um, that was it. That was my first, uh, first time I saw the campus was uh, walking here from, I actually, I got off the tee at Central Square and so went through down Mass Ave and, and somehow found my dorm and, and, and uh, that was it. Yeah, I hadn't, hadn't been here beforehand. So what were your, what were your impressions? Was there, was there kind of culture shock or? Well, I had no idea what to expect and, I mean, really no idea what to expect. And um, so yeah, it was a bit of culture shock, not so much in the size of it, but really I, I was intimidated by just the notion of being here at MIT. I, I think a lot of students have that sense that MIT seems a little bit more exalted in people's minds, uh, certainly before you get here. And it took me a little bit of, of a while to actually feel comfortable, like, okay, maybe I actually belong here. Um, and I think it was after meeting a lot of people who felt the same way that I did. I mean, my, my two roommates freshman year, um, I think, you know, felt similarly like, you know, whoa, what are we doing here at MIT? And just you meet a lot of people. And, and then ultimately you realize that, well, people around here really aren't all that different. Even though, I mean, we're all from very different places, and that was certainly true for my roommates and a lot of the people that I, I knew here as a student. But um, in reality, we all were just, you know, good, regular, normal people who were just trying to do the best we could here. Tell me, tell me a bit more about the, you know, that first semester. I mean, the settling in, learning your way around. I mean, it, it yeah. must have been, it must have been a challenge. Yeah. Well, I remember my first, the first class I ever took, well, the first class I went to, I don't remember it was a 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. class, but it was Spanish, Spanish class. And I had taken Spanish as my language all the way through school, middle school and high school. So I was in Spanish three my freshman year, Professor Morgenstern, and um, I remember going to that first class and I remember just really being unprepared. I had not, we had a pre-assignment for the class and I didn't do it, which wasn't all that uncommon because in high school often I could show up to the class and on the fly figure out what I needed to figure out and it would be fine. 
So I figured, okay, first class, how important was this pre-assignment anyway? So I remember walking into the class and looking, looking at the classroom, and there were a lot of other people in there already. I noticed in the back there were a couple of, uh, of guys sitting back there with, uh, with Greek letters. You know, in other words, they were in, the, in some fraternity, and they had you know, baseball hats on backwards. And I figured, okay, I'd go sit near them, probably be safe. You know, nobody would call on me, and it would be fine. And as the class went on, it became pretty clear that everybody else in the room had done their homework. I was the only one unprepared. And Professor Morgan Stern, what he used to do to people when they were unprepared was he brought a water pistol to class, and he would shoot you with the water pistol if you were unprepared. So I was the one who got doused that day. Uh, we'll never forget it. And it really taught me that, you know, at MIT, everybody really is engaged in their academics and therefore really prepares and does everything they can. And I think I'm glad I learned that on the first day because it really motivated me to say, okay, I'm going to have to put my head down and, uh, and do my work here because that's what everybody does. It was, it was kind of a different experience. It was nothing like high school. High school was, it was a much broader arrangement of, of people who were engaged or not. And um, so that was, that was a real um, eye-opening experience. And it really was true here at MIT. I mean, everybody, you look around, it's really a densely packed with people who are really focused on, on doing as well as they can academically. It gives you uh, some great material to draw on when you give advice to prospective mm -hmm. students and incoming students. Yeah, it's certainly true. Uh, and, you know, it's funny because um, MIT, I, I found it to be in, in an intense academic experience. And I think that's a pretty universal thing. I think students here think it is a really intense academic experience. So now, in my role in the admissions office, I go out and talk with students all the time and, and really want to portray it accurately. We don't want students coming here if they don't want that kind of an intense academic experience. So we try to let them know. Every year in the fall, I'll go off and, and talk to as many freshmen as I can, and I'll ask them, so what do you think? Uh, did you know what you, you know, did we accurately portray MIT? Did you know what you were getting into? And invariably, students will say, uh, it all seemed uh, accurate, except it's a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And I think it's because you really cannot appreciate it until you go through it. You know, there are certain experiences like that in life that you really can't experience. Or you, you can't uh, have somebody explain it to you and, and understand it. You have to really experience it. And I think um, the academics here at MIT are, are like that. You have to go through it. And so no matter what anybody would have told me, and I'm sure there were people during orientation week telling me, you know, it's going to be, it's not going to be like high school. It's going to be more intense. Um, you have to, you have to learn it on your own. And I did. So, so tell me how your uh, interests evolved, both your academic interests mm -hmm. and also whatever extracurricular interests you developed. Yep. So, um, so interestingly, I came here wanting to be a computer science major, and I had done I had done programming in high school. I had learned it initially at this one of these summer programs I did, but then I did uh, science fairs. I did a whole bunch of other things, really like programming, and um, so I came here. And my freshman year, I took a computer science class. A seminar, not not six double oh one, which was the an introductory computer science class. I just took a random seminar, but at the same time, I really liked my physics class. I took eight oh one two, and um, so I decided just to take a mechanical engineering class in the spring of that my freshman year, and just compare the two because I figured, all right, uh, just to take a, a sense for what maybe I'd like to do. And I, I wound up really liking mechanical engineering, that 2001 class, a lot. So I just decided to major in, in, in mechanical engineering and wound up really loving that. The, the biggest surprise, though, for me was not about the academics, but it was what happened with outside the, the classroom. And again, during orientation week, you know, so much happened during that, fir that first week and a half that I was here. But during orientation week, I, I remember being in Newhouse, which is where I lived, 
and there was a pool table in house six and I was playing pool with a couple of other guys and one of them was on the crew team. He was a senior and he was on the rowing team and he said to me, hey, um, you know, you, you're kind of little, you're from New York, you got a big mouth, you make a good coxswain. And I had no idea what that was. I, I didn't, I had never really heard of crew. I mean, I kind of vaguely had some notion of rowing in a boat, but I didn't really know what it was. I had never heard of what a coxswain was. So I asked him to explain it, and he explained it to me. And he said, you know, why don't you come down to the boathouse on registration day, which was the first meeting, and um, give it a try. I said, oh, all right, why not? I did. Went down to the first meeting, met the coach and the team, and um, that was it. I don't think I missed a day from there till I graduated and, um, and really loved it. And that was a total surprise. I had no plan on playing a sport. I had done a few sports in high school, but I uh, had no plan on doing it here. Certainly not rowing, if anything. And uh, it turned out to be one of the most uh, intense and transformational experiences that I had here at MIT was being on the crew. What was it that you loved so much about crew? Well, um, first of all, the team. It was very, it's very much a team sport, and I really liked uh, my teammates. And I liked the notion that we all were working really, really hard to do something really, really hard. And um, you have to work very hard. And, and none of us, my freshman year, none of us had ever rode before coming to school here and we were in a very competitive league and I'll say we didn't you know do that well generally at least my freshman year and um, but that didn't seem to matter what what really I think was the essence of the experience was the fact that here we had a chance to do something as well as we possibly could and it was sort of in an environment where we didn't have any preconceived notions of how good we were supposed to be. So it was very different like, like from the academic side. Coming here, I had all these sort of preconceived notions about how good was I in math, in science, in writing, you know, all of these, all of my other subjects. You know, I had some notion of how good I was supposed to be and um, I was either supposed to be good at something or not, but it, I had these sort of preconceived notions about it or expectations around how I was supposed to do. And down at the boathouse, there were no expectations, no preconceived notions, and there were no limits on how good we could be. And um, we could really see ourselves improving simply by working hard. So the more it was, it was a really clear uh, relationship between how much effort you put in and how good you got. I mean, it was just really clear. Uh, unlike anything I really had seen or done before. And um, so the combination of that and the fact that it, it was a really solid group of guys that I became very close friends with and, and still am. And um, it, it was just a great experience. Um, I think I, I learned an awful lot about uh, life in general, about um, trying something and failing at it and and keeping, keeping going. and. Um, I, mean, I think I learned as much being on the crew that helped me in my future life as I did in the classroom. So <clears throat> tell me a little bit about being a coxswain. I mean, what's the, you know, you, you mentioned you got identified as one because you were from New York and you had a big mouth. Yes. Uh, what, you know. Well, so what being a coxswain is, it's sort of like being a jockey on a horse if the horse were, was a, were, were eight people, you know, were four people. And um, you really have to motivate. I mean, it's really, like what the coxswain does is some technical things like steering and helping with the technique of the boat. But the essence of what a really good coxswain does is motivate the crew to push themselves as hard as they possibly can. I mean, in essence, that's what the coxswain really needs to do. And so in order to do that, you have to build up trust. I mean, it's really all about trust. So you have to build up a really deep trusting relationship with your crew because in, in a race, you're going to ask them to pull a little bit harder, to work a little harder than they even think they can. 
And if they're going to actually do it when you ask them to, they've got to trust that you know what you're doing and that when you ask them to do this, that it's all going to come out okay. So, so a couple things about that. One is this trust that you have to build up. It, it, it's a, it's a really power, becomes a really powerful relationship that you have with your teammates. And number two, you realize that you know you, you have to really use it well. You 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 have to you have to be thoughtful about when you're you're asking um, your crew to to push themselves and when you're not. And um, so so there's there's sort of a lot to it. So it, so yes, you know you have to use a strong, powerful voice. But at the end of the day, it really you you live and die, or you're a good or a great coxswain by how much trust you can build up uh, with your crew. So you mentioned um, that in your freshman year, at least, you and your crew weren't weren't that good, but it didn't matter. You were you were just mm -hmm. doing your best. Yeah. Um, as your career developed and, and progressed, were there memorable races, achievements, sort of competitions that you participated in that are you'd like to talk about? So yeah, I think. Um, so as my undergraduate days moved on, I mean, freshman year, we really weren't all that good. But as I said, we had great experience for all these other reasons. As the, as the my time went on, uh, by the time I was a junior, we started winning races. And, and a senior also, won, we won some races. And um, my junior year, we went to the uh, national championships in a four, a four-person boat, uh, wound up and won a silver medal, which was kind of a neat thing. Uh, after graduating, I wound up coaching. And um, I think uh, coaching back here at MIT, and maybe uh, at some point I'll, I'll relay how all of that happened, because there's, you know, none, none of my career, I think, has been um, you know, step, 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 step. There's been some amount of waywardness to it, in a good way. But, um, but probably the, the, the result that I can point to the most happened when I was a coach. So maybe it's worth thinking, maybe talking a little bit about um, how I ultimately became a coach. And then sure, I'll, I'll yeah. So um, when I graduated from MIT, a uh, degree in mechanical engineering, I went to work for General Motors. In, in, at uh, Chevrolet headquarters in uh, in Detroit or north of Detroit in Warren, and um, and enjoyed it. It was it was a it was a really interesting thing to do. Was living in Detroit for about a year, a little over a year, working there. While I was there, I didn't know anybody. I was I decided to volunteer my time at the Detroit Boat Club which at the time was a, a very prominent boat club. There were a number of, of athletes there who were on the U.S. national team. And uh, I decided I'd just go down and help out, see if they needed a coxswain, and got involved, got to know everybody. A few months after I got there, the person who was coaching their high school junior program left. They asked me if I wanted to coach. And I said, OK, sure, I'll try it. Never done it before, but I'll give it a shot. Didn't really know what I was doing. But learned a lot. Uh, wound up having a crew that turned out to be pretty good. We went to the national championships. I happened to see my old coach there, my coach from MIT, who uh, saw that I was coaching. And he thought, oh, interesting. OK, great. Um, so we talked a little bit about that. A few months after that, he wound up leaving. My old coach left MIT. So there was an opening for a position to coach here at MIT. The person who became the head coach called me up and said, hey, would you like to coach the freshman crew here at MIT? So at first I laughed. I thought, yeah, I'd love to, but I have a job already, and I live in, you know, 1,000 miles away. Can't really do it. But, you know, he said, well, think about it. And uh, I was, had already been thinking that I didn't love living in Detroit, didn't know anybody there, enjoyed the job, but didn't love the job. And was thinking it might be fun to come back to MIT, or at least to the Boston area, to, to work and live, because I had a lot of friends here. So I decided, well, I would take the job and see if I, I could find an engineering job uh, you know, that I could do uh, and I could coach on the side. And so I decided, OK, I took the job. I came back here to coach. 
and um, started looking for an engineering job at the same time. Turns out that I loved coaching enough that I forgot about the engineering and, uh, and became a full-time coach and wound up uh, becoming the head coach here after a couple of years. And, uh, and you know, I wound up coaching at MIT for 13 years and, and really loved it. So now the experience that I, I wanted to talk about uh, was uh, with a team. So I, when I first started coaching, I coached the freshman heavyweight men. And that was great fun. And about uh, in, in the fall of 1996, the uh, coach of the lightweight men's crew had retired and I became the varsity lightweight coach. And this w the lightweight crew at that time was a crew that uh, hadn't done very well the, la the last few years. Um, in fact, they had finished you know, last in the league, both at the varsity, the second varsity, the freshman. And um, so I came in, started coaching the team, some very good, good athletes uh, on the team. And um, we, just, we, we worked hard. At the beginning of the year, I remember setting a goal for ourselves to make the final, which would be the top six at the Eastern Sprints, which is our big championships. And I remember walking into practice that first day, setting that as a goal for ourselves, and everybody looking at me like, um, okay, that's a good goal to have. Probably not going to happen, but, um, but, you know, that's fine. And we were working at it, working at it, working at it. We worked all year. And in the spring, which was our main racing season, we started racing. And we actually were pretty fast. But the first couple of races, we would get a lead. And then I think the guys would get in their head like, oh, wait a minute. We're, we're not supposed to be winning this race. So they would back off a little bit and let the other crews win. And this was, a, this was a pattern. We would get a lead the first half of the race, and then the other crews would, would row through us, and, 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 and we'd lose the race. And this happened a number of times at the beginning of the year. And I remember um, racing. We went down to Yale one weekend. And Yale was one of the top-ranked crews in the country, so we had no expectations of beating them. And it was, uh, I remember, you know, we, we gathered together, the crew, and we said, okay, look, we're not going to beat Yale, and that's fine. So what I want to do is make sure that we, when we ro race the first half of the race, let's just not slow down the second half. And the guys, we started the line. We, we actually had a pretty good start. Yale was ahead of us. But we actually tr followed them all the way through, and we didn't slow down that day. So the guys actually learned, okay, well, maybe we can row a race without slowing down. So the next week, we raced against Rutgers. It was here on the Charles River. And it was Rutgers had a fast crew, but it was one we thought we might be able to beat. So we had the same pattern happen as the prior weeks in that we had gotten a lead. And right at the moment when, in the past, we used to just let the other crews walk on through us, guys remembered their race the weekend before against Yale and saying, you know, we don't actually have to slow down. And they didn't. So they sped up and they kept going and they actually wound up winning that race, which was the first race we had won all year. And it was a, a really mind-shifting thing for the crew. So two weeks later was our Eastern Sprints Championship. And we were lined up in, in the morning heats and we had to finish in the top three in order to make it to the final. And so similar pattern as to all these other weeks. In fact, against the same crews that we had lost to through most of the year, we wound up getting a lead on all these other crews. And um, the guys had actually learned that they didn't have to back off. And they wound up coming through and they made the final, which was just uh, a, an incredible uh, experience. I mean, it's, it, I think for me, the most memorable experience that I've ever had. And I mean, I've had a whole bunch of really great races in my life. I've, you know, won a lot of things. I've, I've raced internationally. And, um, but that particular race was particularly meaningful. It was a, 
a time when, when these guys just a few weeks earlier had thought one thing about themselves and about how, there's, how their, the, their place in the universe, right? They're not supposed to beat a lot of these crews. And with just a little bit of a click in the mind, um, they were able to perform just a whole step function better. And uh, it really points out how important you, you know, your, your self-image and, and all of what happens in your mind is um, to allow you to achieve things. You know, forget about whether it's, a, it's just a sport, because re in reality, you know, whether you win or lose in a sport doesn't affect the universe you know, or the world, doesn't make the world a better place, doesn't make you a better person whether you win or lose. But it's the lesson that you learn around what your, your potential is, what the possibilities are, and how you know, just your attitude about things can really make all the difference. And it was just an unbelievable learning experience. For me, for the guys, it was really a pretty remarkable thing. And it's, it's something I'll, I'll never forget. That must be something that's <clears throat> pretty good for you to draw on as somebody who spends a lot of time now advising young people in things that are actually pretty significant and pretty serious for them Yes. in their life. Well, it's certainly true. And you know, a, a while ago, I, I talked about how you know, when I first came here, well, one, I thought I was admitted by mistake. Number two, I, I felt like I didn't deserve to be here. And it's all just in your mindset and your attitude. And uh, it took me a little while to warm up to the fact that, okay, maybe MIT is a place where, where I, I do belong and I'm comfortable. Uh, but for a lot of kids, it's not true. And, and it's certainly true of, of students um, who are thinking, of high school students who are thinking about applying to colleges. There are many who are just intimidated by the thought of applying to a place like MIT. Oh, I'm not that good. I'm not that smart. It may be, in fact, many of them are, but they don't realize it. And so it's really just in your, your attitude and, and how you think about things. And, you know, a lot of that can be pretty powerful because how you think about things is built up from a whole set of experiences that you've had. I mean, for us on the crew, the reason the guys never felt they could win races is because they never had. So, you know, that's pretty powerful. So for a lot of these high school students, particularly those who, who haven't had, you know, the teacher or the mentor or the counselor that has really helped instill in them some confidence of, of who they are and what their, their potential is, um, it can be a really daunting thing. And so it's something that I like to do and I, and I think our staff really likes to go out and talk with students who are really, really talented and to try to break down this notion of, you know, MIT as this inaccessible place that is just too intimidating, uh, we really try to break that down for students. So what kind of place do you think MIT is for students of, and we'll talk about diversity and how mm -hmm. the student body has changed in a, in a bit, but what kind of place is MIT for students of, of varying backgrounds? And I don't just mean ethnic, but I also mean sort of, economic, class, yeah. social experiences, education. I mean, you mentioned that you, your parents hadn't gone to college. You certainly yeah. weren't sort of, yeah. you know, born and bred to go to an elite institution. Right. What, what, is, what is MIT like for students like that? And is there a way of distinguishing MIT from other top schools? I mean, is there something different here? Well, I think, yeah, I, I think MIT is a little bit different. And um, in that the pace is really high pretty much right away. So I think many students come in uh, with this notion that, um, that they don't belong here yet. So they, they feel like they're at MIT, but, but maybe uh, they're, they're not a part of MIT. It's sort of a different, um, almost like it's, it's a privilege for them to be here at MIT. And, and of course, you know, many of us feel that it is a privilege, but, but this sense of belonging. And I think it can be harder for students who come from uh, places where where they don't where where many of their peers don't go to places like MIT because they think oh this is not my world and I think that is certainly true so it's harder for some students to adapt and become comfortable here the thing that becomes hard about MIT in particular is that the pace is really hard so the academics are tough and there are some things in place that that the MIT has done to try to help ease the transition the pass no record system, I think, is 
is critical and really important for students. The fact that there's actually a credit limit so that you can't take more than a certain number of classes your first semester or even your second semester here as well. So I think those are helpful. And I think, um, you know, the classes are hard, but the, it's also the fact that the students, the, the culture of the students is one where everybody is revved up and working hard. And I think that's different than at many other places where there's more of a balance between the academics and other activities. Um, but MIT, the, the academic side, it's, it's sort of like a really, the treadmill is on high and there's no way really to step off the treadmill for a little bit. You know, you, have, you just have to stay on it. And um, so I think that is one of the things that really um, makes it a little bit more challenging for some students. Now, we do have a decent number of students here from uh, different backgrounds, right? From backgrounds, you know, the, the lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, and also uh, from students from, you know, geographic, geographically from other places. So kids off of farms and, and inner cities, you know, from all over the place. So there's, there's a large enough uh, percentage of students that I think that helps people to feel a little bit more at home. So it's not as though while students on their way in here may feel like they uh, are going to be different from everybody else, they may feel a little bit isolated, once they get here, they do find that there are other people like them from similar backgrounds to them. And I think that helps. So to return to your undergraduate experience here just mm -hmm. yep, briefly, sure, sure, um, sure. because we kind of followed the crew yeah. thread a, a yeah, bit, yeah. and that was totally fascinating. Um, Talk a bit more about your academic experience. So you you know you you ended up studying mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of students, in my experience, who study mechanical engineering, kind of grew up building things, tinkering. W were you were you one of those kids? Uh, and if not, what was it like getting into mechanical engineering? What were some sort of memorable experiences that you had? Yeah. So I grew up not really tinkering with things. Um, I grew up uh, liking science. I was good in math, and I, I, I was somewhat advanced, and I had done things like math team, and I had uh, done science fair or math fair type projects um, that, that included uh, computer programming and math theory. That was more of my thread growing up. And um, when I, so when I got here, that's when I had said I had thought about computer science as a possible major, but liked mechanical engineering better. Um, so there are a couple of threads or, or, or a couple of different paths you can take through mechanical engineering. And um, the one that I, uh, uh, well actually I pursued two of them really. One was um, control systems, which is more of a, a little bit more of a theoretical type of um, path, right? A little bit more heavy on um, math, mathematical modeling and uh, basically control systems and you know, robots and, and those kinds of things. Um, but I also did enjoy design. Uh, a, a big eye-opening class for me was the 270 contest. Woody Flowers was my professor. And um, that class, I will say I did not do very well in that class. But I learned an enormous amount. And, and, and I actually think that shifted uh, shifted paths for me towards thinking about going into design. That, I mean, that class for me was, uh, I had, didn't have a lot of experience in, in actually machining things and building things. And so the, the project that year or, uh, or the contest that year was, we had, there were ping pong balls in the middle of the table and we had to harvest them and get them behind us more than our opponent. And the machine I built uh, number one, I was the only one in the entire class that actually came up with the strategy that I came up with, which should have been a red flag to say, don't do that. <laughs> um, but I, I was a little bit stubborn and I persisted. And also, the, um, uh, I wasn't that good at machining. And so when you looked at it, you, you kind of, it's like, what is that? You know, I, I had, you know, a good friend of mine built this really simple little robot that could, you know, go in. It was like a little vehicle. And he really cared about how it looked. So he painted it. He lined up all the, the um, screw grooves 
you know, so that they were in line with the actual uh, member that it, that it was up against. So, you know, everything was like really immaculate on that. Whereas you looked at my machine and it was, there was epoxy everywhere and screws and, 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 you know, scrap pieces of metal in the wrong places. It was just awful. But um, I actually, I actually really liked my machine. And um, when it came time for the contest, it actually worked. Unfortunately, I came up against the eventual winner in the first round, so I got knocked out. And also, I hadn't, the one thing I had missed was not testing early enough. Because um, I, my machine would have worked, but there was, there was one thing that didn't work quite. And, and it took me all of that last weekend to try to actually get it to work. And in fact, I was still building it when I was online getting ready to actually compete. So if I had another 20 seconds, I feel like I could have been done it better. But I wound up um, actually getting the thing to work a little bit. And uh, if I had gotten it, if I had actually gotten it started earlier or gotten it to work, I actually think I could have won the whole thing. But anyway, it didn't work. And, um, but, but it got me excited about the possibilities of this. You know, in other words, you could actually design something to do something and when it worked it you know it was just a really amazing feeling and um so uh, so after i that class i took my junior year and after that uh, my senior year i still taken a control systems class but i um and in fact did my thesis in, on a control systems project but i also took a mechanical engineering design class my senior year and uh and then wound up when i got a job, we looked for jobs in design. And that was, so it was really that class that sparked my interest in going to work for General Motors designing cars. And, um, you know, just this thought that, you know, you can actually create something from nothing with, and there, and there are whole different ways of, 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 coming, of coming up with solutions to problems. Uh, it was just really interesting to me. I just really enjoyed it. So you mentioned Woody Flowers and the 2007 contest. I mean, yeah. obviously Woody's an MIT legend. Um, were there other professors, or maybe you could talk about Woody a little bit, just you know, who were very memorable, larger-than-life characters who either you learned sort of important things from or are yeah. worth talking about? So I think, well, Woody certainly. I mean, and I think um, in terms of my, if I think of my uh, trajectory at MIT, uh, I mean, the two people that really stand out. One is Woody, and he actually, you know, sort of steered my, uh, my academic career. But my coach, my, my crew coach, was someone who I think I learned more from here as an advisor and as a mentor than anyone. And, and ultimately, I mean, if I look at the big arc of my life, I think um, really uh, bent that arc. Who was uh, your crew coach? So Pete Holland was my crew coach for most of my, I had a, fr a separate freshman coach and, um, and I had another coach my, my senior year as well, but, but Pete Holland really was the guy who um, um, I, I think you know, really gave me confidence and um, you know, just taught me a lot about the way the world actually operates and um, really uh, uh, bent, bent the arc of my, my education here and ultimately my life as well. Not long after leaving MIT, you returned to MIT as a coach and then ultimately went on to uh, fulfill a lot of other positions at the Institute. Talk a little bit, a little bit about how that happened. So um, I was, came back to MIT to coach and, and did that uh, full time for 13 years. And I was getting to the point where I uh, loved it and was thinking, OK, well, maybe I'm just going to be a coach for my entire career. And that would have been great. That would have really been great, I think. But a couple of things I also rattled around in my head. Number one, uh, in the late, in 1999, my first daughter was born. And coaching is a tough uh, profession from a time commitment point of view, which I know it sounds odd for an admissions officer to be saying that some other job is a, you know, big time commitment. Uh, but it is true. Coaching uh, early mornings, late nights, weekends, and then most of your summers are gone as well. So it can be, uh, be gone a lot. So I was thinking about that. And the other, I was just curious of whether I could actually
do something else besides work a stopwatch and use a megaphone. And it um, wasn't clear whether that was true or not. So, um, so I started thinking about it and had some really informal, I wasn't really planning on doing anything or making a change, but um, I just started having some informal chats with various folks that I had known around MIT. Uh, one of the folks I talked with was Bill Hecht, who w ran the um, Alumni Association at the time. And coaching crew is a, uh, it's an expensive sport. And it's one where we really rely on the support of our alumni. So I'd gotten to know a number of alumni over the years and really enjoyed interacting with them. And uh, as it happened, as I was having these conversations and thoughts, a job opened up in the alumni office, and somebody that I had known let me know about it. It was working for her, and she let me know about it and um, said, hey, is this something you might be interested in? So we started talking about it, and um, I decided, well, I would do it. I would uh, make a change. I would retire from coaching and go to work for the alumni office. And um, did that for about two, two and a half, three years. Uh, really enjoyed it quite a bit. My, I had a, a whole range of responsibilities there. One of the things I did was um, organize coordinated family weekend for MIT, which, you know, which is a big uh, institute-wide event that you know, pretty much everybody on campus gets involved with, which I thought was a really interesting thing. It's also sort of interesting for me because I had gone from coaching a sport to I, I was doing fundraising as well, but you know this planning family weekend. I would never have thought of myself as an event planner. It wouldn't have been a thing that I would have thought would have been something I would have uh, enjoyed or gone into. But I wound up really enjoying it, and it really struck me that the thing that I really enjoy about that the same is very similar to the things that I enjoyed about coaching, and that is that the opportunity to lead a team of people to do something really, really hard. And, you know, given those kinds of conditions, in some ways it doesn't matter what the thing is, um, I, I got a lot of satisfaction out of that. And so it really helped clarify for me what kinds of steps, uh, you know, would be good to take next. And in fact, now when I'm in the admissions office, I find the same thing. I've got a, a really, really terrific group of people that I work with, and we do something really, really hard every year. And uh, so I really like helping to organize and motivate and, and coordinate uh, really good people together to do something really, really hard. So, so I learned a lot in that in my job in the alumni office. Really enjoyed it. Um, did a combination of this event planning, um, fundraising. Uh, tried to connect current students with our alumni, a whole range of things. And um, I think the MIT Alumni Association really does a terrific job at, at, uh, at getting alumni uh, connected back here. I mean, in many ways, we're really lucky to be at a place like MIT where, I mean, everybody acknowledges the, the, the level of, uh, of excellence that really occurs here with the educational program, the research enterprise. And there's a really large amount of pride that people have to be associated with place. So, so I really, really appreciated my time with the alumni office. Um, was also very, very happy doing what I was doing. And a couple of years into that, the guy who had been running the alumni interview program, the Educational Council for MIT, was leaving MIT. And uh, he, I had a conversation with me. He, he told me he was leaving. He asked me if it would be something I'd be interested in applying for. And I decided, well, sure, why not? Um, I, the thing that I really, uh, that intrigued me about this job in the admissions office was the chance to work with students that much more. I mean, I really enjoyed working with alumni. And in fact, this role leading the educational council you know, our alumni, volunteer alumni interviewing program was almost a perfect sort of bridge because I'd still have an opportunity to work with alumni, but also get to work with students a little bit more, which was something I had missed a little bit from my days coaching. So it was a really good sort of neat fit. 
And so I applied for the position and, and wound up getting it and, um, and, I, and really loved doing that role as well. And I thought really it was um, a, a really great fit for, for things that I like to do. And um, so I wound up uh, leading the educational council for some number of years and then, then became, became the dean. So um, tell me a little bit about um, the admissions process. I mean, I, you know, you're the, you're, the, you're the person to ask about this. I mean, clearly um, it's a huge challenge logistically and in terms of just, the, you know, managing everything that has to happen. Um, but how, you know, how has that grown over the years? How has that changed? So, so the admissions process in some ways has changed a lot over the last just 10 years and in some ways hasn't changed at all probably over the last 50 years. So the ways that it's changed has been uh, largely in volume. So we now have uh, over 18,000 applicants from all over the world and um, that, that's a big increase. So we have, you double the number of applicants that we had maybe 12 or 13 years ago and we don't have double the number of staff, so um, so logistically, there's a lot to uh, to try to uh, allow us to actually get through reading all those applications, making the decisions that we have to make. Technology has entered into it, so you know there are some things that have changed. Certainly, students have changed a little bit. Maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more in a little bit. But the, the, I want to talk about what really the core and the essence of what hasn't changed, because I think that's really important. Because I think often you hear about all of the changes in college admissions, how, oh, it's impossible to get into college these days and everything has changed. You know, and there are some important changes, but the core of what has not changed for us here at MIT is that we are still trying to bring uh, the best students that we can who are a good fit for MIT, those who are interested in math, science, technology, engineering, you know, those core uh, interests, we're trying to bring the best students that we can to MIT. Students that have demonstrated potential, who have a real interest in being creative and free thinking, you know, who aren't constrained by uh, what's come before, but really are willing to break boundaries and, and create new things. Students that have shown some kind of initiative, so students that uh, are motivated because they are interested in what they're doing, not motivated because they're doing something that they feel like they have to. So these sort of, you know, sort of free, uh, uh, motivated, really engaged, enthusiastic students uh, we're trying to bring here to campus. And, I, and, I, and, and I've done a lot of reading over time to see how MIT's uh, philosophy has been over the years. And, and I think that's always been true. We've always been looking for those students that we feel are going to come to MIT, use the opportunities and experiences that they have here at MIT, and go off and make a big positive difference in the world. I think that's always been true, and it, and it remains true. And of course, the fact that we get so many more applicants these days, and it is true that students have changed. I mean, the environment that students have grown up in has changed quite a bit over the years. So uh, that certainly uh, makes the admissions process a little bit different, and I think it makes the educational experience a little bit different here. So we were just talking about uh, how the admissions process and also the student body itself has both changed and not changed. Uh, just go on with, with where you were, were at there. Yeah. So things, certainly uh, the environment the students have grown up in has changed quite a bit over the last uh, number of years. And um, I, so a couple, let me highlight a few things. Um, first of all, the demographics have changed quite a bit. So if you uh, look at the U.S. and uh, you see that uh, th there are the, the demographics of the country have changed. So uh, students that traditionally have been underrepresented in uh, universities like MIT are now attending colleges like MIT. And so if you look at the student body, it's a much more diverse place here than ever before. Uh, and particularly with students, uh, not just 
uh, uh, from, from U.S. minority backgrounds, but also students who are uh, not just inter international students, but who may be first generation in this country as well. So the student body has changed quite a bit, and the, the demographics of the country have changed, and that's going to continue, in fact, into the foreseeable future. So that's one. The second thing is that parents really have changed quite a bit. And so uh, parents these days are more involved and engaged with their students or their children's lives, in some cases from birth all the way on up. And so you see students that have done a lot more structured enrichment over time. And it's true inside schools. So in the last generation, students now graduate, on average, students graduate taking a third more classes in high school than they used to just a generation ago. So even in high school, students are doing more, but outside high school as well. So there's more uh, sports are now structured. So I grew up playing stickball and paddleball at the schoolyard. My daughters grew up playing in soccer leagues and one of them does kung fu at the local uh, uh, you know place and so it's very much more structured with instructors that are actually helping uh, raise the, their ability right I mean when I grew up um, you know we didn't have a stickball coach you know or a paddleball coach you know we just played but now coaches are helping um, on top of all of the other things that students are doing between music and community service and all of these other structured activities. So some of that is great. Students are getting opportunities that they've really never had before. And some of it is a shame because there are students that are uh, pursuing all these other enrichment opportunities uh, and in some cases really overloading more than they ought to. A lot of students out there don't have the kind of downtime that that we once had, and I think uh, the balance is not always right for students. I mean, this is a problem generally. For some students, cranking up all these activities is fine. They have the bandwidth to be able to do that, and they can go do that. There's a whole set of students who don't have the same kind of uh, of capacity really to just keep cranking all the time and have that be productive for them and yet there's this sort of cultural push for them to do it. It's not good for those students. So uh, it, you know unfortunately there's this one-size-fits-all kind of attitude about childhood and how to prepare yourself for college that is not good for all students and that, that I think is a hard thing. Nonetheless, many of the students that we see coming into MIT, because remember, we're only taking a really small sliver of, of the great students that are out there in this country, many of those students have done an awful lot of things in high school, and so they're used to doing all kinds of activities. And I think that's played out on our campus as well. The number of, of student activities has grown you know, enormously over the last 20, 30 years, uh, even in the last 10 years. And uh, think about the, the public service center. The, the number of students getting involved in service uh, has also just exploded here. I mean, students these days are incredibly busy. When I was an undergraduate, I, I went, took my classes, I was on the crew, I had a job, but I also just wasted an enormous amount of time. I mean, I, I, grew, I, I lived in Newhouse, and in, in one of the lounges there, I used to go and sit in the lounge, and just talking with friends would, you know, would come, you know, in fact, whole groups would come in and leave, and I'd just be sitting there just for, for huge amounts of time, just kind of doing nothing, you know, just, or not nothing, but just hanging out, talking with folks. And I think students these days uh, are, don't have the time to do that kind of uh, just sit around and, and shoot the breeze kind of thing. And, um, and I think it's not, they don't come here with that, with that makeup, and, and once they're here, there are so many things to get involved with, they just keep cranking up. So, again, I think it's good and bad. I mean, on the one hand, students are taking advantage of so many more opportunities than ever before. On the other hand, 
it's important for them to make sure that they do keep some balance in their life. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard balance. So there's good and bad there. It's also, it also seems like kind of a culture of multitasking. I mean, mm -hmm. you or maybe, maybe I, when we were undergrads, would sit in a lounge and talk, and now people are texting or tweeting while they're doing yes. other things at the same time. That's right. So they may be sitting around in a lounge talking, but they've got their laptops out. <laughs> yeah. So they're emailing somebody else or, or Facebook or whatever they're doing. Um, yeah, I always feel like they have to be accomplishing something. It's really a culture of accomplishment. I mean, in fact, you know, to get to a place like MIT, kids feel like they have to have accomplished things. And you know, to some extent, that's true. So that, that's sort of the mindset. I never thought about that when I was in high school. Like, what do I have to accomplish so that I can get into college? I really didn't think about that. I was able to do things because I really enjoy doing them. And so kids come here, and it's about, they have this sort of accomplishment mindset. You know, so they feel like they've got to always be doing something, can't be wasting time. So you're right. And the technology, of course, is an infrastructure that feeds it. So there's sort of, you know, be, if students feel like they have to always be doing something, well, now they have a platform in a way to always be doing something. Uh, you know, they could be emailing somebody or, you know, they can always be doing something. And I think the technology really feeds that. Again, it's good and bad. I think, you know, obviously the technology has, has been an enormously positive thing in so many ways. But unchecked, it's, uh, it, it can also uh, lead someone into a, a less balanced life than, than maybe they ought to be leading. I wanted to ask you about the um, aspect of this that is basically just increasing com competition. Uh, obviously, the number of applications has exploded mm -hmm. at MIT and at, at, at other schools. Uh, p students feel like they need to stand out more than mm -hmm. perhaps you or I might have when, when we were going through the whole yes. process. So it's certainly true that with so many more applicants, students feel like they need to stand out. I should first say that, um, and the press reports this as though it's harder to get into college. In general, in the U.S., it is easier to get into college than at any other time. Meaning the number of college seats per high school graduate is higher now than at any time it's ever been. So it's actually not harder to get into college un 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 unqualified, even though I think many students are afraid that they're not gonna get in anywhere. The reality is that it's easier to get into college now than it has ever been because there are more college seats than ever before, or per student. But what everybody focuses on are the 40, 50, 70, 100 colleges that are a little bit more selective, or in MIT's case, you know, very selective, that as students may be their first choice colleges, those schools are harder to get into. There's no question about that. So, and, and I think sometimes students lose the first part that, you know, they're going to get into college uh, in thinking about the fact that they may not get into a place like MIT. But, of course, what that has fueled is uh, the revving up of high school years, students uh, making choices for themselves that are, unfortunately, not always the best choice for them to make. So, you know, I, I hear about this all the time. Students not wanting to do activities, even though they would love to do them, but choosing not to do them because they don't think they're going to look as good to colleges. And so what they'll do is load up and take more AP classes uh, because that's what they feel like uh, colleges are really going to want to see. Uh, or they'll do a lot more SAT prep training. You know, they'll do all these other things that they feel are going to give them a stronger resume to get to college uh, and forego some of the things that they would really rather be doing. The unfortunate reality is that they're making often the wrong choices because the very things that they're n choosing not to do are the things that we want to see. We want to see students who are pursuing the things that they, want, that they love and that they really want to pursue. We don't want to see students just doing things because they feel like they have to. You know, the reality is that we do wind up admitting students that have taken a lot of classes and, and um, you know, done a lot of different activities. But it is almost never 
because they've taken all those classes and those activities that we wind up admitting them. We wind up admitting them because we saw some sort of spark that I talked about earlier, this notion that these students are fully engaged, uh, doing things that they love to do, being creative, showing initiative, taking risks, um, ed educated risks, and not, not, not personal safety risks, but, but academic risks. Uh, not being daunted by failure, you know, trying things that they don't know whether it's going to work or not. Those are the kinds of things that we really try to look for. And um, so the students who are able to resist the urge to load up on a million different activities and yet focus on the things that they love to do, they wind up being very, very successful in the process because that's really what we're looking for. The hard part for students is that, uh, you know, they're a little bit lost. They don't really know. And because we get so many applicants who are really strong and we can admit you know, a large number of our applicants, students will see that and they, they don't necessarily understand how we make our decisions. Right? They see some kid maybe who's a senior, let's say they're a sophomore or a junior, they see somebody in their school who's a senior who applies to MIT who's a terrific applicant, winds up not getting admitted though. So those kids think, whoa, if that kid didn't get in, what do I have to do to get in? And so they rev themselves up even higher without really realizing that that's not really revving themselves up even more is not going to help and it may even hurt their chances. Because this is the first time that students, for students, that they can do all the right things and still not have the outcome they want. Right? All through their lives beforehand, they're told, if you do this, you will get this reward. Right? I mean, that's, your parents set that up, right? If you, you, know, you tell your kids, if you do this, that, and the other thing, you can have your cell phone. Or we'll get a dog if you do all these things. Or you, know, you, you can have an extra half an hour on the internet or watching TV or whatever it is. Right? So, so students learn, if you do this, you get that. The college admissions process at selective schools doesn't work that way. You, do, you can do all the right things and still not get in. And, and it's the first time that these kids have ever really experienced this. Now, of course, we all know that the world is like that. You know, so after college, the world is going to be like that. You can do all the right things and still not get the job you wanted or, or have other things happen that you wanted. But this is the first time that these students have experienced that. So what winds up happening is they wind up revving themselves up even more, thinking, well, that's, I, I can just do more of it, and that'll make me be admitted. And of course, that doesn't work. But I think that dynamic is uh, it's ultimately an unhealthy one. Um, it's unsustainable, and it seems to be getting worse. So I'm going to ask the follow-up question that everybody would want me to ask, and yes. this is the part of the interview everyone's going to fast forward to who's looking at MIT as a prospective student. Yeah. So you, you talk about 18,000 applicants. Mm -hmm. You talk about this, this process. Tell me about the process. What is the process for winnowing down the applications? How do you make your selections? And you've touched on this, but what's the secret? Yeah, you know, okay, how do, so how, the how, secret, we'll see, we may run out of time before I actually get to the secret. We'll see. <laughs> um, you know, there is a secret, right? All right, so um, first thing is that we gather information on our applicants. And first thing for applicants to, to know is that that's, that's what we're making our decisions on, on the information we gather on them. It, and that is hopefully a good representation of who they are, but it's not perfect. So that's the first thing for all students to know is we can't possibly know them fully inside and out. So we get information really from three different sources. One is from what the students themselves, the applicants themselves, tell us through the application, on, um, th through their essays, through their actions, meaning we look at what they d do in high school, how they choose to spend their time, what their activities are, what classes they've taken, the grades they've gotten in their classes, you know, their test scores, all of those things. You know, those are things that the applicant really is responsible for presenting to us. The second way is information we get from other people who know the applicant. So we get recommendation letters, 
from teachers, from guidance counselors, in some cases from others, music teachers or employers and so forth. So uh, we gather information from recommendations from others who know them. So that's another sort of slice of how we get to know our applicants. And the third, for us at MIT, we have an interview. And we have alumni all over the world who do interviews, and they, they will uh, interview applicants and talk to them about their, you know, what their interests are, their motivations, their activities are, and will write a report to us. Not all colleges use interviews, but, but we do. So we take all uh, of those inputs, and we have s staff members. Uh, every application gets read fully, and um, when we're reading, we're trying to form a picture of who the applicant is. So we're taking the different inputs, we're corroborating them, right? So does what the interviewer says uh, match what the math teacher is saying? And does that match what the student is saying? So we're trying to put all this together. And then we synthesize all of this into a picture of who the applicant is. And our staff member will write some kind of uh, summary and notes and with an eye towards some of the things that we look for. And um, so maybe I'll just mention what some of those things are now, rather than keeping everybody in suspense. Uh, we look for, well, first of all, academic uh, ability, talent, and promise. So um, we look at what the student has achieved academically, you know, what their grades are, if they've done some other academic kinds of things like science fairs and, and debate team, robotics, you know, those kinds of things. So we look at how they've done. We try to map that onto where they're coming from, what opportunities their high school had, right? So if, if a student is coming from a high school where they don't have very many AP classes, we're not going to expect that they will have had very many AP classes, right? So we, we have to map all of that together uh, from where a student has come from. And then we try to form an opinion as to their academic ability and their promise, right? In other words, how good we think they're going to be. So it's a, it's a measure not just of an accomplishment to where they are at this moment, but what their potential is as well. So the academics, and for us at MIT, the academics really is a primary uh, notion for us. Um, of course, we look for interest, deep interest in science and technology and engineering because MIT's education is centered on that. It doesn't mean that all students have to want to study a science or engineering field. You know, and there's a, some number of students who come to MIT and who major in things other than science and engineering. And that's great. We value that. We really look for that. But even those students who are going to major uh, uh, in business or in political science or, or something that is not in the School of Science or Engineering, uh, we still look for a deep interest and appreciation of science because, again, they're going to have to take a lot of it when they're here, and, and really MIT is centered on that. So that's, that's important. Um, now, the reality is a lot of our applicants are academically well qualified and would do really well here. So that's not all that we look for. We also look for personal qualities, so things like character, integrity, uh, leadership ability, communication skills, those kinds of uh, things, teamwork, you know, all these, these sort of personal skills that help a student be successful, both here at MIT and afterward. So we're looking for those kinds of things as well. And so as our, our admission staff are reading applications, that's another one of the things that they will look for. Another thing that, student, that, that we will look for in applicants is uh, the sort of talents that it may not be academic, but they may be uh, extracurricular. So things like sports and music, and um, you know things that aren't necessarily academic, but other talents that students might bring to campus. Because you know MIT, it's a vibrant place. We've got a terrific symphony. We've got a, a really good sports program, student government. You know we have we have all of the all of the things uh, that a vibrant campus community should have, and, um, and we want to support that. It's important that we bring students here with certain interests and talents so that we can continue to have a vibrant community. So we look at all of those things. We wrap all of that around looking for students who are a really good match for our culture. Our culture is one where 
it's an intense academic environment, so we want to make sure that students are going to be okay with and thrive in an intense academic culture. And in high school, some students are, are up for that, and some are not. And it's, it's not a, a value judgment as to who's better or worse. It's just a recognition that this is what MIT is. And so if we're going to admit somebody, we want to make sure that we feel comfortable that they're going to thrive in, in the intensity of the place that MIT is. So there's, there's the notion that students uh, should be ready for the MIT education. Um, but there's also, we like students who are creative, who like to build things, who like to create new things, who are willing to, to try uh, uh, something new that they don't know whether it's going to work or not. And who, and who are okay with the fact that it's not going to work the first time. You know, those kinds of, uh, of, of characteristics, you know, the resilience, initiative, those kinds of things. And lastly, we really want to bring students to campus who have a real enjoyment and uh, with what they're doing, uh, a real enthusiasm. Students who get positive energy from working hard on the things that they're doing. Because um, we, we want to fill MIT up with students who are uh, engaged, enthusiastic, positive, uh, helpful to each other. Uh, and, and, and so we look for students that may exhibit those qualities uh, in high school. So those are, those are some of the things that we really look for. Our staff will, will read with an eye towards those things. And once our staff reads all the applications, we make our decisions by committee. So it's never just one person making this decision to admit somebody. Every, and this is true for all of our students. Uh, there's no fast track to admission here. Everybody goes through the committee process. A group of staff will, will sit around, chaired by a senior admissions officer, and make decisions on who we're going to admit. And you know the reality is still that we have many, many more applicants who fit the bill that we would love to admit than we can possibly admit. So we have to go through several rounds of this, uh, continually winnowing down the number until we get to the number that we're ultimately going to admit. And that's, that's really the hard part is uh, the understanding that you know, there are a lot of really terrific applicants and we've got to ultimately get down to a number. You know, one of the things, of course, that we try to ensure when we finally settle on that final number is that you know, the pool is relatively diverse in interests, you know, so that uh, we have students who are athletes and who want to do student government and write for the tech and, uh, you know, uh, do the dance troupe and those kinds of things. You know, we like to have students, who, you know, with a variety of, of different backgrounds and, and, and interests because ultimately that's what we want to fill MIT up with. I remember a couple of years ago, I ran into Matt McGann from your office mm -hmm. pushing a huge <laughs> set of file folders down the hall on a dolly. You know, yes. it's like they were getting you were getting ready for that first yes. round, and they were moving all of the all of the applications. It was yes. quite an incredible sort of visual image that I'll always remember. Yeah. Um, what's the minimum attention that a, that an applicant gets? I mean, you talk about the several rounds. You you know, I mean. It's hard to sort of wrap your head around somebody, you know, reading all of those files. Right. Well, it's true. We get about 18,000 applications, and there are, I don't know, 16 or 17, maybe 18 uh, staff who are reading. So if you do the math, that's about 1,000 files per um, staff member. Um, and I would say our senior staff tend to read um, a, a a bit more or see more of the of the uh, files and 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 also I think our newer staff take a little bit longer to read a file but it takes about 50, and every application gets read fully it takes about 15 to 20 minutes uh, for uh, for a seasoned staff member to read a file and new staff members often take a little bit longer than that it's one of the things that I was incredibly uh, amazed by is the thoroughness, when I first started, was the thoroughness that we go through and read every application. And not just read every application, but if ever we have a question. So if let's say there's something that a teacher says about a student that we don't quite understand. Well, what do you mean by that? We'll call the teacher. Or if let's say the interviewer says something that doesn't seem to appear anywhere else in the application, 
we'll investigate that. We might call the interviewer and say, well, can you tell us a little bit more about this? Or we might call the school and say, all right, let's, uh, how, do we, um, how do we reconcile these things? So we, we do an awful lot of follow-up, which when I first started, I couldn't believe it because I, I really imagined, well, first of all, it was hard to imagine we read every application, um, but we do. And uh, it's because, you know, test scores and grades really aren't, first of all, most of our applicants have test scores and grades that are very, very good. But even those that are a little bit lower, um, those aren't a reason in and of themselves that we're not going to admit someone. And you never know, there might be something in that file that says this kid is going to be fantastic. And, and you have to read it all the way through in order, in order to know that. Um, I was amazed at the thoroughness of it. And um, I, actually, I think it's something that we all take great pride in. The fact that we, uh, we really put the student and the applicants at the center of our process. And all the things that we do with our policies, our decisions, uh, we, we try to benefit the applicants and the students uh, with that. Um, and and I, I think it's something that we're all really proud of that we do. So the, the cliche uh, description of an MIT student used to be uh, that they're, you know, uh, Maybe the nice way of putting it is less well-rounded than yep. mm -hmm. students at other yep. top institutions. You know, the nerdier, mm -hmm. less sort of less uh, interested in sort of the, the social worlds. Is that uh, kind of outdated? Is that less true now? I mean, how have things shifted? Yeah, I think it, I think it is outdated. So when I came to school here I, uh, in 1982, fall of 1982, there was no communication requirement, no writing requirement, and in fact. My freshman year, they gave us a writing test, and I think we had done so poorly on it that the next year they instituted the writing requirement. So sorry about that, although actually it's a good thing. And I will also say that I, I took a writing class, even though I didn't have to, my freshman year, and it was probably the most useful class I ever took at MIT in terms of my future life, I mean, without, without a doubt. The ability to organize and convey my thoughts uh, turned out to be which I don't think would surprise a lot of people, but it certainly did surprise me in my, you know, freshman days. So, of course, now it's, it's clear that communication skills are an important part of the, an education here at MIT and an important part of what an educated person needs to have anywhere. And the reality is, and, and some of this is an outcropping of the fact that we have so many more applicants we can be a little bit more selective in who we're admitting, but the students we are bringing here uh, really do have broad interests. And while yes, students are interested and focused, you know, universally on science and engineering, many of the students who come here also have other interests and other talents and other skills. So while our math SAT scores are very high, our verbal SAT scores are are as high and 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 you know and if you look you know rankings around through the um, the Ivy League our verbal scores are amongst the highest even amongst Ivy League schools and and another and and not that SAT scores are in any way a a, a full measure or picture of a student but it does give you a bit of a a clue as to the kinds of students that we're bringing here they really do have multiple talents so. You have a maybe an almost unique perspective for answering this next question. Thinking back to 1982 when you first came to MIT with your duffel bag, um, yep. to, to the present uh, as Dean of Admissions, how has the student body changed? Uh, and I know there are a lot of ways to answer that question. Yep. And, and where do you see it, you know, how do you see it continuing to change? What, what about the future? So I think, um, I, I think I've, I've mentioned how it's changed. It's a much more diverse set of students, okay? Um, you, know, you can just look, look, you walk down the hallway at MIT and you can see that immediately. So there are students coming with different experiences, different backgrounds, and that I think helps any individual student learn about the world in a better way. Um, so that, that's one. Number two, students uh, come here having been busier in the past, and so they're doing more activities even once they're here. And I think th those two things, coupled with the internet, wrap around to the fact that I think students themselves are more aware of the world and more conscious of the fact that they have the potential to make a difference in the world. It gets talked about a lot more. College admissions officers talk about, you know, we're looking for students who are going to change the world. 
Uh, now, 30 years ago, that you never really heard that. Um, and the internet has allowed students, as they've been growing up through middle school and high school, access to news about the world that we never had before. I mean, you know, I will say when I was growing up and I was in high school, I didn't really read the newspapers very much. And that was your way of learning about the world. I suppose we could have watched the evening news on one of the three stations, but didn't really do that. But now with the internet, students have uh, much easier access to learning about the world. And I think students come here with much more of a, of a sense, a global awareness, much more sense of the world, and, and their ability to actually have an influence. So let me, let me give you an example of why I, act, I think this, beyond the fact of what I see students doing here. But on our application, one of the questions we ask is, what program uh, most interests you about uh, coming to MIT? Or what, what are you most interested in doing when you come here? And we usually get answers in one of two ways. One, either they will say, well, I would like to study math, or I want to study electrical engineering, or political science, you know, the, uh, something very specific. Or students will say, I want to help solve the energy crisis, or I want to help uh, get climate change under control, or I want to cure cancer. In other words, students who are thinking uh, about a problem they want to solve, less connected to a specific discipline that they want to study. And there's, I think there's a really key difference. And I think the shift that we've seen over time is 30 years ago, students were thinking about what do I want to study? And now students are more thinking about what do I want to work on? You know, what, what kind of problem do I want to work on? And if you think about it, things like cancer research or energy or climate, these are things that you can study just about anything and have an effect on that. So I think students these days have a bit more of a sense of the, the bigger picture of the problems. And, and they, so I think just have a little bit more of a heads up view of, of, of the world, which I think is a really good thing. I mean, I think that's going to help. And I, I think uh, the MIT education has evolved. It's become uh, more project based and I think uh, more interdisciplinary. You see an awful lot of uh, collaborations for degrees. So the most recent one is um, uh, courses six and seven, computer science and biology, making a comp computational biology degree that students can pursue. But some of these um, engineering programs, uh, the flexible engineering degrees that students can pursue, I think uh, are, are very attractive for students these days because it allows them the freedom to work on problems and, and not be locked into specific disciplines. I think that's one of the changes that we've seen, you know, driven by, uh, I mean, the internet has really helped uh, fuel this a lot. And um, I, I think that's a really good trend. So where do you see things going in the future, both uh, for the admissions process and then, also, then the, the resulting student body yeah. and, and educational experience? So I think, um, Starting with the educational experience first, I think um, th this trend is going to only continue. And the other piece of it that I hadn't mentioned is that the, the students are learning more online. And I think even here at MIT, you're seeing uh, online tools helping to augment the, the residential-based education that we have. With the announcement of the startup of MITx, one of the real focuses of that not just the fact that it's going to be outward facing to help learners all around the world, but also the piece, the inward learning piece, where uh, it's a real, it's a move to try to help, uh, again, enhance the education that students get while they're here using online tools. Uh, it may change the nature of classes, right, uh, you know, or semesters even, or, or where students have to be when they're learning. So I, I don't know how that will all shake out, but I think that will certainly change. And I think um, students are going to be ready for that. I think they're ready for that. I mean, I think in high school, you, there's a, an, you've seen an increase, or we've seen an increase, in the number of students who are taking online courses in high school. So I think it's not going to be anything that's going to be a, a big shock for, for students. So I think that's something that's going to be probably the biggest revolution over the next you know, decade or two in, in the education here. How that will affect the admissions process, 
Well, uh, it's hard to know. I mean, I, I, I always hesitate to try to predict too much because that's a hard thing to do. Uh, I have this sense that, you know, with 18,000 applications now, we're getting a fairly good portion of the number of uh, students, you know, highly qualified uh, and interested in an education like MIT for MIT. And um, I, I, I'm not sure I see that that number increasing in really large form uh, much over the next uh, several years, or at least from students studying in the U.S. Now, I, I think it's likely that we will see growth in applications from students from overseas because while we do have a, a fairly high portion of our applicant pool are international, um, the world is a really big place and there are a lot of really talented students out there. And I think especially as the MIT online presence has really been reaching people all over the world, I think there's a, a potential for the, the number of international applicants to continue to grow. Uh, I, I think we're going to continue to look for students. So regardless of what happens with the applicant pool, and, and, and one thing I want to be clear about is that we're not trying to build the, the number, you know, the size of the applicant pool simply by recruiting students who we don't think we'll ever admit. We're trying to reach out to students who we think are really strong applicants for us and make sure they're aware that MIT is a good place for them. And I think with that, the size of the applicant pool may not grow, but you know the, the quality of it may continue to improve. But um, as far as the decisions that we'll make, um, I'm not sure we're going to make very different decisions uh, going forward because I think the decisions we want to continue to make in a very human and subjective way, looking for students who are going to thrive here, who are going to take most advantage of the opportunities that MIT has to offer, and who will contribute most to our community. And I think that will always be true. Um, so I think at, at heart, our intent is to really maintain the same kind of admissions process that we ever have, regardless of, you know, we may have more and better information on students coming in. And certainly if MIT X continues along, we may have information on students who have already passed 1801, 801, and, and uh, 1803, and all, all, you know, we'll have more information on students. But at heart, we're still going to make the same kinds of decisions that we ever have. So um, one thing I wanted to do as we wind down is uh, just ask you or give you an opportunity to talk about any um, other memorable colleagues, professors, MIT personalities that might have had a, a major influence on you or, or are particularly memorable. I mean, we've talked about Woody Flowers and a couple yep. of other people. Anybody that you haven't had a chance to talk about? Um, well, I'll tell you. Um, I know uh, certainly Woody and, and my my old coach from my undergraduate days. Uh, those two um, really stand out. And uh, you know, the the thing about MIT is um, it's it's a science and technology centered place. But when we go out talking about MIT, we really talk about the people. Uh, because it's the people in this institution that I think make it great, make it really meaningful and enjoyable to work here. Uh, I don't know that I can uh, single out uh, individuals, um, um, but I think, you know, uh, right on down from Susan Hockfield, uh, you know, and Eric Grimson and Raphael and, and Dan Hastings, everybody that I've worked with here, I think, um, has a real... A commitment to uh, being a leader, number one, to making sure that uh, you know MIT is going to be a, a place where uh, breakthroughs are going to occur, and whether that's in the labs or in the educational environment, um, you know that's both of those are, are I think are people we're we're interested in, and um, and I think are committed to doing the right thing for the right reasons, and it's one of the things that I really appreciate and love about being here. So my last question, unless you have anything to add, um, are you still at all involved in crew at all? Or you, do you get out on the water as, as a coach or in any other capacity? Well, not as, nearly as often as I would like. Again, the time is it's hard to steal time uh, when I can. I do race in the head of the Charles every year, which is good fun with folks that I've been racing with for, for a number of years now. Not MIT folks, but people 
who come in from all over the world, and uh, and and we we race in Masters events, and so that's a lot of fun. I still keep up with the the crew, uh, although uh, making sure that I remain objective and and impartial in the whole admissions process, so that the, they don't get any. Uh, of, and and they would probably be the first ones to tell you that <laughs> we're certainly not favoring them, but. Um, but I, but I, I know the coaches well and, and talk to them and and, uh, and certainly have an appreciation for what they do and really an appreciation for what all of the, the coaches at MIT do. I, I think coaching at MIT is particularly hard because we really, um, the admissions office holds our student athletes to a much higher standard than you'll find anywhere else, uh, maybe with the exception of Caltech, but anywhere else with a uh, the kind of broad-based and successful program that, that we have. And um, so I think it really makes it tough for the coaches. Also the fact that our students are so involved in their academics and, and other parts of life, um, you know, may, I think make it hard for, for the, the coaches. So I, I, and I have a real deep appreciation for that. And um, so that's my, I still stay connected to it all, but uh, you know, just Hard to find the time to, to actually do much more. But you do race in the head of the Charles? I do race in the head of the Charles every year. And it's been fun. And, and actually, I race with a bunch of guys, and we tend to do pretty well. And that's the beauty of being a coxswain is I don't have to stay in, in great shape, although I do, I do run, um, uh, you know, not, not, maybe not every day, but, but most days. And um, I just have to stay light, and i got to make sure I don't lose my voice. And, uh, and beyond that, um, the guys I race with are good enough. We just come in and... and uh, go for a practice the day before, hop in the race, and, 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 and go. And it's a lot of fun. Well, Stu, thanks a lot for coming in. This has been really wonderful. Well, Appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. So thank you. Thank you.